say loss to automation you know jobs that could come back manufacturing jobs that could come back would come back to be automated not into our workforce Milwaukee was a big um, manufacturing city uh, what are you what are you doing on the federal level to you know head try to head this off to some degree and well, and also training stem training for for um, <coughs> high schools um, and, and, and then for the state, on the state level, I want to uh, talk about safety in the schools. I mean, my, my kids are scared. I talk to my work at a school now. I ran a business for 30 years, but my kids are scared. 
I, I mean, I didn't think so, but then we were talking at family meetings, and they're afraid. And nobody's doing anything about it. Well, first of all, you know, let me say that the tax reform that was passed in December is bringing jobs back to America because we had the highest marginal corporate tax rate in the world, and that's what encouraged corporate diversions and encouraged jobs uh, to exodus the United States. And that, together with uh, uh, the fact that there is going to be an amnesty for bring back, bringing back money that multinationals kept overseas because they did not want to pay the repatriation tax is actually helping investment in this country, uh, creating jobs in this country, and providing more revenue for the federal government. For example, uh, uh, Apple, you know, announced that they were going to bring back $360 billion that they had. They were going to be building more plants to build their, or manufacture their products here, and these are good paying jobs, and they estimate that it will create 20,000 jobs. They also will be paying $38 billion more in federal in corporate income taxes that they wouldn't be paying if the tax reform hadn't passed and they would have kept money overseas. Now, with respect to STEM education in the public schools in this state, uh, state law uh, uh, says that uh, textbooks, curriculum, and method of instruction are determined by the locally elected school board. So this is a local decision and not a federal decision and really not a state decision to make. Uh, we have passed legislation to encourage uh, STEM education, but again, actually getting into the classroom in a public school in this state is going to require the local school board's approval. Uh, as far as school safety is concerned, uh, 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 we passed federal grant money to help harden schools uh, and to bring retired police officers in uh, to increase the safety. But again, this is a federal grant. It would be up to the local school districts to uh, make the determination on whether to apply uh, for a federal grant. Uh, I also can say that uh, uh, we have passed legislation uh, that provides more money for the instant check system uh, because a lot of the uh, uh, tragedies that have fallen through the cracks has become some because some states in the military have not put the data in that would prevent somebody who would do others harm uh, a block in the instant check system uh, that would have blocked them from obtaining firearms or ammunition. Now I'll defer to Representative Branch and for the state part of it. So the state of Wisconsin has put a hundred thousand a hundred million dollars into schools. As a matter of fact those grants are coming the deadline was uh, yesterday, or excuse me, Friday at midnight. The Department of Justice has made a special section that will a uh, uh, special section of the Department of Justice just to handle schools. So schools are now reporting as far as what their evacuation plans, and then extra dollars was allowed for every school for the next three years, uh, three years of participation into funding for uh, school safety. So that was one of the special session issues that Governor Walker had taken up. What kind of things are they implementing or allowing for that? Because it's always a dollar issue. Sure. You know, well, I want to let you know that we left it, the, the Department of Justice left it open really for the schools to determine how best it could be used. Cameras, security officers, all those things were left open to the schools because every school has a different footprint. Many of the schools were built earlier or later. Um, and also to put things in perspective, Menominee Falls, um, the police chief from Menominee Falls, I'm not sure what school your kids attend, yeah. has been interested in that for many years. As a matter of fact, they've been doing drills for almost 10 years. So uh, going forward, there has been additional funds, both at the federal level and the state level, to make sure there's additional funding for schools. But I also think that a larger conversation for our kids, they have to have the conversation that if they see something, they have to say something. The kids are the ones that see a lot of things on the internet and as far as Facebook and Instagram and all those things, they're going to have to be a first line for if they have a concern they need to talk to a parent, a teacher, and probably a principal to make sure if they have students in the classroom that they think are being violent or saying terrible things. I mean, this is going to require all of us to work together. Well, a lot of times they know who it is. I mean, there's a few at every school have mental issues. I mean, they know who they are. And our schools are not locked down. I mean, they can get indoors, people let them in, you know. So, you know, our resource officer 
pretty much knows who a couple of the, the problematic kids are. But they can get in and, and you know, they're tight. They, they, the mental health, they can't take them anywhere. Right? We, had, we had one instance and, and the mental health just refused to deal with them. So if he's stuck with this, you know, kid, that is a danger to people. So they don't know what to do with them. The cops have no resource to take some of these people. That's my concern on that end. You know, the drills, the drills, I mean, the shooting's over in, in a few minutes, usually, 10, 10 minutes. So drills, yeah, they help, but, you know, locking doors, cameras, you know, uh, hard lockdown stuff is I, what I want to see, you know. So. And those dollars have been there both at the federal and the state level to add to the security. But I do only, in Waukesha County, we do have a really good mental health system. And I, I don't know when you're well, saying they've got It was Waukesha, and they turned them away. They're, they're, over, they're overwhelmed. You know, so, well, you know, let, let me add on to this. Uh, uh, the current law uh, uh, forcing someone with mental health issues is you have to be a danger to yourself or a danger to others. And the only way you convince a judge to be a danger to others is to harm somebody. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of after the fact. Uh, we ought to change that. Now, there are a couple things I think we should do. You know, one is, is we should change the law to allow either school or law enforcement or mental health people to petition a court to put a temporary block on somebody like you have described who has shown a propensity maybe to cause harm to somebody in the future but hasn't caused harm to somebody yet. If you put that block on the NICS system, you know, then they're not going to be able to obtain firearms or obtain ammunition. Uh, because uh, that will show up, uh, you know, we have to do this before it happens rather than afterwards, and you know, in this country we do the due process first rather than second. Uh, the second thing that I think needs to be done is to have a thorough review of what the uh, mental health laws are, because you have to, you know, actually harm somebody else to be a danger to others you know, is a loophole wide enough to drive an 18-wheeler through. And we've had a number of tragedies uh, that have occurred because people have shown that they may have mental health problems, but you can't even get them evaluated if they don't want to be evaluated until they actually harm somebody. That has got to change. Now, the final thing I would point out is that uh, my crime subcommittee had a hearing a couple months ago uh, where the deputy director of the FBI uh, uh, appeared and spoke about uh, the kid, Nicholas Cruz, who shot up the high school in Florida. And that happened in February. In November, uh, there was somebody who was surfing the web and found out in a Facebook post that there was a Nicholas Cruz to put up on the web that he wanted to be a professional school shooter. He called up the FBI. The FBI sent a special agent and a computer geek out to see him. This was in Mississippi. And they took down the information, uh, but they couldn't prove that Nicholas Cruz was the right, the correct name or an alias. Now, fast forward until after New Year's, uh, there was somebody in Cruz's neighborhood in Florida who called up the FBI and said there had been 39 911 domestic violence calls that the local police uh, had responded to. And uh, what happened there was is that the FBI said, well, this is something that there's no federal nexus to. This is a local law enforcement function. Uh, and as a result, the FBI didn't put it into the computer where it could have been matched up with the November uh, information that came about as a result of the contact in Mississippi. The deputy director of the FBI said, we're at fault. Something fell through the cracks here. And it's the first time in all the years that I've had in Congress uh, where the FBI has come in and admitted it made a mistake. Well, our resource, uh, resource officer knows, and he's frustrated. You know, he's, he's a Waukesha County Sheriff, and he has nowhere to go with these kids. I mean, you know, he's a full-time, you know, resource well, officer. Well, you know, again, again, the law says... He's walking around with a knife. Again, the law says that, you know, in order to do something about it, the person who has got a mental problem actually has to harm somebody. And, you know, I, he's frustrated, and the law should be changed on that, you know. You, you, you know, you shouldn't get what amounts to a free massacre 
uh, before something can be done about the fact that you're screwed up mentally. Well, and you see that depression is up, I mean, 30% in the last decade or so, or two decades, and mental health is just, yeah. suicides are up, and it, you know, it's, okay. it doesn't seem like it's going to get better. Well, I, you know, I've told you what the law is, and you know, it can get better if we change the law. And, you know, I think they've said how to do it. Jim Brundage, Apple Valley Drive, he calls. Howdy, nice to see you. Um, Thank you. Uh, I have a question, maybe a follow-up. Um, as, as I think everybody in the country knows, we seem to be starting a trade war with the rest of the world. Uh, you know, I know that the trade system today has, has existed in recent years is very, very unfair. But history shows us that every trade war that ever happened, there's no winners, everybody loses. And so, I'm, yeah, and basically, this trade war being fought by uh, imposing tariffs or type of tax. And well, it's been a long time since I was in school, but my recollection is, is that taxes are imposed by Congress, not by, by, by the president. And so, I'm wondering why the president is starting this without any. As far as well, I know. Uh, you know, first of all, repeated trade wars have given the president the power to unilaterally impose tariffs. You know, whether it's a so-called countervailing tariff because a foreign country has a government subsidy to dump their products below cost in the American market, which happens all the time. China is a big offender in that one, so is Korea uh, on that, or for you know whatever other purpose. I can tell you that uh, I was one of 101 Republican congressmen that wrote both the president and trade negotiator Lighthizer saying that the trade and the tariffs that were being proposed were a bad idea. And I, I hold to that position uh, because the retaliation that goes on, you know, as a result of that is going to hurt uh, uh, American manufacturing. It is, you know, for example, tariffs on Canadian aluminum, you know, will add at least a penny to the cost of every can of beer. Uh, talking about hitting home uh, on that. However, if Congress does pass a bill, uh, the President will veto it. And I can tell you there is no way that that kind of a veto will be overridden. Thank you. Okay. Les Ibach, McClellan Court Falls. Do you believe that Kim Jong-un will denuclearize North Korea? Well, let me say that's the, been the goal of every American president since Bill Clinton. Uh, Clinton and George W. Bush reached a deal with the royal family of North Korea. Uh, they got our money, they got food when the people were starving. Once the heat was off, the Kim family uh, ended up uh, breaking the deal and continuing their nuclear program. Now, you know, what I can say is the only way that any denuclearization deal will work is if there is a transparent and effective verification system uh, that will make sure that the North Koreans are not cheating on whatever they promise, if they do promise anything. And there's a way to do it, which, you know, I have advocated to people both in Korea and in Japan. And that is to copy the verification deal that Reagan and Gorbachev uh, reached when they reached the agreement to get rid of intermediate range missiles uh, in the 1980s. And since that time, um, uh, there have been Russians that have been able to go anywhere in the United States and show up without notice to make sure that there have been no violations on our part. And Americans that have been able to go anywhere, first in the former Soviet Union and now in Russia, to make sure that they are cheating. This has worked. There has never been an allegation on either side that the other side is cheating. And this is something that I have very uh, forcefully advocated uh, to both the Japanese and the South Koreans. I can tell you the South Koreans, you know, have been very, very interested in that. And while I have not talked to President Moon about it, I have talked to the foreign minister and the CIA director of South Korea, and they think that that's the way to go. 
And you know, there's nothing that we can do in terms of a bilateral agreement uh, between us and Kim Jong-un uh, that has to undercut the South Koreans because they've got more involved in this, uh, a, a, you know, a greater a stake in this than we do. <coughs> Kim Jong-un seems to be reaching out. Is he wanting North Korea to become a member of the community of nations? Well, you know, that remains to be seen. It certainly is not genetic because both his father and grandfather didn't, uh, didn't want that. However, the North Korean economy is a basket case. You know, people are starving there, even those that don't live in the gulags. And the human rights uh, uh, violations in North Korea are the worst in the world uh, on that. You know, you know, this is kind of, you know, all wrapped into it. And, you know, I do think that this is going to require more than one summit, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, the fairy godfather is not going to wave his wand and, you know, everything is going to be fine. Because that's the mistake that both Clinton and George W. Bush made, uh, you know, on that. But we'll see, you know, what kind of a start there is. You know, I think he's going to want diplomatic recognition, which would mean that we would open up an embassy in North Korea. Uh, uh, you know, if he has some concessions, and then not just on the nuclear issue, but on the human rights issue, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, you know, I think, you know, when it comes to money, uh, you know, you've got to follow the money, and since he's already gotten some, uh, the money ought to come after the denuclearization and not before, because we did it the other way once and lost a lot of money on that. You. Okay, you're welcome. Don Bach, Jaguar Road Falls. I'd like to speak to another uh, issue that I think many of us in this room are concerned about, and that's the issue of illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. And uh, my little four point uh, notes that I brought out on is first of all, we believe it's out of control. We have concern about the abuse of our social benefit systems that are paying these illegal immigrants. We have a concern about people that refuse to call them illegal when they are, in fact, they're not undocumented. They are illegal. We are 100% against sanctuary cities. We think that's an awful way to solve the problem. And we'd like to know when will we regain the control of our borders? And when will the migrants be returned to the places they came from? Well, that's probably you know, one of the most vexatious issues that we are facing. You know, Let me say my bottom line is no amnesty. You know, amnesty gives a benefit to people who broke our law uh, and uh, actually harms people who have been obeying the law, applying for a visa and waiting very patiently for their name to get up to the top of the list. Uh, we gave an amnesty in 1986. This was after a Blue Ribbon Commission that was headed by Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame, who is a self-admitted liberal, uh, who said if we give amnesty, uh, it will only encourage more illegal immigration. He was right. Reagan was wrong when he signed the bill. And we had three to three and a half million illegal immigrants then. We now have a lot from between 11 to 20 million immigrants, and nobody knows exactly what the, the number is. Now, you know, there is a move in Congress that may come to a head next week. Not this week, but next week. You know, relative to the DACA kids. And, you know, the thing is, is a lot of the DACA kids have been here for a long time. And I do not have a problem in allowing them to stay here with temporary but renewable work permits, but not give them uh, a pathway to citizenship. And the reason that giving them a pathway to citizenship uh, is a Trojan horse is because once they become citizens, then they can petition to bring in their parents who broke the law in the first place and brought them here when they were children. And we get to the whole issue of chain migration. So pathway to citizenship means that without getting rid of chain migration, means that we are just increasing the problems that we have with chain migration. Uh, I also have a problem, you know, that if we give them citizenship but not petitioning rights, then there are two classes of American citizenship. That would be the first time in the history of the country where we had that. You know, and that is a precedent that I think is going to have a lot of uh, uh, unexpected.
unexpected consequences. Now, Trump has been very plain, you know, in saying that he is not going to sign any kind of relief for the DACA kids uh, unless he gets his uh, border security fully funded. That is not exclusively a wall anymore. He is back down on that. Uh, he says build the wall where the wall can be patrolled because if you build a wall where it can't be patrolled, you know, people will bust through it, dig under it, or jump over it. But where it can be patrolled and then do high-tech stuff uh, in places like in the mountains uh, where it can't be patrolled because the terrain is too rough. One of the proposals that I think he has merits along the Rio Grande, you know, is to have a levee with fairly steep walls and about a three-foot fence on the top, and that would deter illegal crossings of the river, which could either be a torrent or a trickle. And I've seen, been down there and seen it both, but also would have a great deal of benefit in terms of flood control and the floodplain, you know, on our side of the border. So, you know, Trump is going to be insistent on that. Now, he put that proposal up, I believe, in March, and Senator Schumer rejected it, and the Democrats uh, uh, filibustered it together with the DACA relief, uh, and it didn't pass, and then Trump pulled it off the table. So I guess it all depends upon, you know, whether we're going to be some, see some flexibility on the part of the minority party. Because if there's no flexibility and what happened in March is repeated next week, then you're going to be seeing the Democrats putting their opposition to any kind of border barriers, whether it's a wall, a levee, or high-tech stuff, ahead of their uh, support for the DACA kids. And they will have to explain that. I will not try to. As far as sanctuary cities are concerned, uh, you know, I have supported legislation which passed the House and died in the Senate, you know, that takes away federal uh, law enforcement grants to sanctuary cities. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a historian. Uh, it seems to me that when there were cities and states that decided to ignore federal law and reject them, we had a civil war as a result of that. Because that's what the southern states attempted to do uh, 160 years ago as the way to protect the institution of slavery. The good guys won that war. L. Karnak, the Nominee River Parkway in the Falls. Yes, I'd like to know your ideas and feelings about the pending ideas on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security funding. Those of us that are our age that are already on it are going to be all right, but I get concerned about the future for our children, grandchildren. Well, you know, let me say there's no bill that has been introduced that has been seriously considered to deal with Medicare and Social Security. With Medicaid, there is legislation that I don't think is a bad idea, you know, that basically turns the Medicaid program uh, into something that's run by the states. They run a good part of it now with a huge block grant, you know, in order uh, to make up for the federal money that's lost under the current cost-sharing program. And, you know, I say this because each state has got different problems and providing a social safety net for poor people, which is what Medicaid was designed to protect against. You know, our problems in Wisconsin are not the same in New York City or the same in the Mississippi Delta. And I have, you know, a lot more uh, 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 confidence in the Wisconsin legislature coming up with a Medicaid program that will be good for the people of the state of Wisconsin better administered than the federal uh, uh, directed uh, program is, targeting uh, the aid to where it is needed, uh, and, you know, perhaps saving some money, you know, in the short and medium term. Now, you know, let me talk a little bit about Medicare. You know, there are four different parts of Medicare, A, B, C, and D. Uh, B is financed not by payroll taxes through the trust fund, but by general tax revenue. Uh, C, which is uh, uh, Medicare Advantage, you know, is funded by those seniors that decide to elect to go to Medicare Advantage, uh, uh, assigning their Medicare A and B benefits to the Advantage carrier. 
and B is paid for partially by the government, but mainly uh, by the beneficiary, and that's prescription drugs. Now, last week, the Social Security trustees uh, gave its report on the fiscal health of Social Security. And Medicare A, the hospitalization part, uh, they, the date where it goes broke was advanced three years from 2027 to 2024. Now, I don't think that uh, Congress is going to deal with that issue uh, until after the election and the new Congress is seated. But we better start dealing with it quickly and figuring out uh, how to fix that problem because next year, 2024, is five years away and the wolf is approaching the door licking its chops. <clears throat> and it's better to get rid of the wolf before it's at the door. Jefferson Davis of Sheridan Drive in Menominee Falls. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, you've asked us for comments or questions. I'm just going to make some very brief comments out of respect to the folks that are here that would also like to speak. But before I do, thank you, Representative Branchum, for being here. Thank you for your leadership on Foxconn and all those wonderful jobs and unbelievable taxes that are going to come and help our economy. Thank you for your leadership and supporting Act 10. Our schools are stronger, our communities are stronger, our public works. You know, we had all the naysayers that our state was going to fall and collapse. It hasn't. My taxes are lower now than they were eight years ago, so thank you. Congressman, my brief comments come in these three contexts. One, the economy. Two, judicial. And three, national security. First of all, the economy. Who would have ever thought that we would have more job openings in this country, according to the Department of Bureau of Labor, than we have people that want a job? That's unheard of. Our growth is going to come to 4% here, it's projected, in the next quarter. Um, we have revenue coming in because of the tax plan reform that you supported, most states and the federal coffers, than we've ever seen before. And those that said, oh my gosh, it's going to ruin this country, just the opposite is happening. It's getting better. So from an economic standpoint, thank you. From a judicial standpoint, uh, Justice Gorsuch is working out great on the Supreme Court. We hope that we can get a good conservative replacement for Justice Kennedy if he uh, retires this summer. And also the appellate courts and all the lower levels, all of the appointments that have been made by the President and confirmed by the Senate, thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate constructionists and not those that make laws from the bench. So thank you for that. And finally, very briefly, for the national security. Thank you that we are finally getting money back into our military where our tanks can be driven, our planes can be flown, our ships can sail, and our military people that put their life on the line every single day so that we can come here tonight and be part of this town hall. Thank you for supporting and restoring our military. And also, a gentleman commented on immigration. Thank you for your support on that. It's about time that we get someone that has the courage and the leadership and the conviction to make that happen. And finally, let me say this. Your staff is approachable, they're accessible, and they're accommodating. Thank you for having such wonderful people that support you. And thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you. Denise Cook, the Clown Court Falls. Hi, I'm Denise Cook. I live in Menominee Falls. I know you're very fond of giving history lessons with your answers. Um, I can assure you I don't need a history lesson on this comment question. But if you want to put it in historical context for the rest of the people here, that would be fine. Have you no sense of decency, sir? I do, and what I will say is, is that I'm getting a little sick of the name calling of people who don't agree with conservative or Republican principles. And saying that someone is indecent because they disagree with anybody on a political issue is not democratic with a small d. You know, if we look at what has happened, uh, you know, around the world, when people are shouted down, people are intimidated, when people's opposing views are not respected, democracy is hurt, and in some cases, democracy is killed. Please think about that. The last I checked, all of us here are your boss. Uh, all I'm, elect us. I'm elected for a two-year term. I put my record on the line every two years as this representative branch. I represent about 730,000 people. I don't expect 
all of those people to agree with me all the time. Even my wife doesn't do that. <laughs> um, there's sometimes I can go and she says, why did you vote the way you did? But I do think that for people who would vote the other way, if they had this office, they are entitled to an explanation of why I take the position I do. And sometimes it requires a little bit of historical context. Uh, because Winston Churchill, I believe, said that those who do not learn from the mistakes of history are bound to repeat them. Churchill was very right on that. So, uh, you know, every two years I put th things on the line. I have 730,000 bosses, so to speak, who live in the 5th Congressional District. I try to do the best job I can to vote with the majority of the people a majority of the time. And it seems to me that given the margins that I have been reelected by, at least in the past, a majority of the people have agreed with uh, the trusteeship that they have given me each time uh, that I have been elected to another term. Ellen Neubauer of Schlafer Drive in the Falls. I have a, a short but very important comment. I believe every woman needs to be able to make the choice of whether she can lovingly and financially care for a child if she becomes pregnant. Otherwise, she would come unstable due to the stress of raising a child at that particular time of her life. If given a choice by Planned Parenthood... Could you please address your comments to the two of us up here? Oh, sure. If given a choice by Planned Parenthood as to whether she is able to educate a child for 18 years, she would gain self-esteem and continue on her journey as a productive member of society. It would be helpful by Planned if Planned Parenthood could offer some free counseling sessions to women in this situation. I do not agree that supporting Planned Parenthood would lead to mass genocide, as you stated in your letter to me. a few months ago. Please rethink your position on approving funds to support the work of Planned Parenthood. I believe the majority of childbearing age women are decent, respectable, and well-meaning people. I have three granddaughters that have used it. One is now happily married with two children, but when she was using Planned Parenthood, it would not have been a good thing for her to be pregnant at that time. Um, I urge you to have faith in this group of women also. If you can't do anything legally, I urge you to at least love and respect them and honor them in your own heart. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. I have to respectfully disagree with you, you know, on that. And I have made no secret of my pro-life positions throughout my uh, public service, both in the legislature as well as in Congress. Uh, Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider in the country. Uh, and uh, defunding Planned Parenthood is not going to mean less money uh, for women's health because every proposal to defund Planned Parenthood is to transfer those funds to community health services that do not get involved in abortion but provide the same type of counseling and the same type of medical treatment and referrals 
uh, to uh, women who come on in there. You know, I, I believe that life begins at conception and ends at natural death. And there are about 1.5 million abortions that are performed in this country every year. And Roe versus Wade has been the law of the land uh, now for 45 years. That means that over 60 million babies have been aborted. I think that's a genocide, and I'll leave it at that. Joan Plumley, Countryside Drive in the Falls. I'd like to speak to the issue of immigration and refugees. Um, I'm concerned that our country is refusing to take asylum seekers when their lives are in danger. Um, last Sunday at our church, we heard a speaker, a pastor um, who's from El Salvador, and he was telling us about um, the, you know, the amount of gangs and the power of the gangs in El Salvador. There are 30 to 40,000 gang members there. And if the boys, like age 12 or so, um, do not want to join a gang, they are killed by gang members. And so their parents are kind of stuck between a rock and hard place and, and try to get their sons out of the country in order to save their lives. Yet if they come to the United States, they are turned away. And that is the breaking, we are breaking international law that was set up by the United Nations to protect people whose lives are in danger. And to, this is great concerning to me. Okay, well, I think there's a bit of confusion between refugees and applicants for asylum. There is no United States Convention, to my knowledge, on asylum. You know, each country deals with the asylum question according to its own laws. There is a UN Convention, which practically everybody has signed, including the United States. Um, refugees, and it defines refugees as someone who has a well-founded fear of political or religious persecution if they return home. Uh, people who are leaving because of lawlessness, people who are economic migrants are not included in the definition of refugees uh, according to the UN. And people who get refugee visas are interviewed at embassies and consulates outside the country to see if they qualify before uh, they get a refugee visa. And these are limited in number. Uh, Congress does not have a say in the number of them. Uh, that is set by the Secretary of State on an annual basis, but he has to come and consult with the two judiciary committees on what the numbers are, and this is divided up by continent. Uh, so it all is in one continent or another continent. Uh, we have applicants for political asylum. Uh, it is different, and they have to have a well-founded fear. Uh, and that system has been gained uh, because what has happened in the past is that the immigration judges who determine whether the claim of a well-founded fear is legitimate or not uh, do it on a first-in, first-out basis. So someone who is told to say, I have a well-founded fear when they get to the border, is paroled into the country, and is told that they will have to appear before an immigration judge when their name comes up. <coughs> now, what happens is, is that if the vast majority of the people who uh, get notices to appear before an immigration judge do not appear, and the judge issues a default deportation or removal order, uh, because they didn't appear on that. And, you know, this is the same kind of thing as a bench warrant issued by a judge if any of us would blow off a traffic ticket by neither showing up in court nor paying the fine before the date on the summons that, uh, on the citation uh, that the officer handed people. So there have been a lot of people that have been picked up because they've been here for a while. There was a default order that gets put in the FBI computer when they're stopped in traffic, you know, they get picked up and turned over to ICE and, uh, you know, either go before the judge or are deported. What has happened recently is that instead of having the system of first in, first out being gained by people who disappear in the country, 
It's now last in, first out. So somebody who comes across the border says they have a well-founded fear, they can be put in detention for 72 hours, they go before the judge who is on the border, say what their well-founded fear is, and the judge makes the determination. So this is something that is done through a judicial process and through due process, and the people who are sent back, you know, are those where the judge has made the determination uh, that they did not qualify for asylum in the United States. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to express my concern about um, immigration and the way that the children are being torn from their parents' arms and separated, you know, separated from their parents and that, you know, families are being torn apart by this. I, I think this is just a violation of human rights, of, you know, the foundation of families that we value. Well, you know, I can say that there's, <coughs> there is no reason that ICE would act unless there was a valid judicial order uh, calling for their deportation. Now, many of these orders, as I said, are default orders. So the people decided that they did not want to have their day in court for whatever reason. Uh, there's nothing against uh, young children being taken with their parents if they happen to be uh, uh, deported. But that's a decision that the parents would have to make. You mean the parents are deciding to have their children removed from them? Is that what you're saying? If they're deported, the parents can decide to take their children with them or not. And that's up to the parents, as it should be. This is new. She's talking about on the board. Yeah. Richard Ebert, Nancy, and Samuel. Hi, Richard. I was the one who had asked to speak. Uh, the U.S. Senate is controlled by the Republicans. The House of Representatives is controlled by the Republicans. The sitting president is a Republican. I'm wondering when the Republicans are going to align themselves with the president, because I always consider the, whoever the president is, the leader of that party. And it seems we're going to run out of time, or the Republicans are going to run out of time to accomplish the things that the president wants to accomplish, where the Democrats seem to always align themselves together. They kind of get that. How soon do you think uh, the Republicans well, get them together and, and accomplish what the president had promised. The House do. already has. You know, we passed repeal and replace Obamacare. Uh, that got filled in the Senate. We passed uh, tax reform. That got passed in the Senate. Uh, you know, we passed a number of important bills that have been signed, you know, recently, including the right to try bill where terminally uh, uh, ill patients, you know, can try drugs that are, you know, in the process of being uh, tested. These are, you know, all really big things. Where we have a problem is the filibuster rule in the Senate. Uh, the split in the Senate is 51-49 now. You need 60 votes to pass practically everything in the Senate. And I was looking, you know, uh, at my cell phone before this meeting came up. There are 503 bills that have been passed by the House of Representatives that the Senate has not had the time to take up. We are doing our job. Uh, the Senate, because of obstructionism, uh, is not. And I talked a little bit earlier where there could be something done, you know, for the DACA kids, you know, in exchange for uh, support for funding uh, the physical barriers that, that Trump has called for, which is not exclusively a wall anymore. What happens? Senator Schumer gets up and says no dice. He has 49 votes. They vote against it. Uh, and the bill has to be dropped. So, you know, I guess, you know, look at the way things work. Now, there is not one member of the House, Republican or Democrat, uh, that would not be in favor of the Senate getting rid of their filibuster rule to allow the majority to rule in the United States Senate. But they're kind of proud of the filibuster rule. And, you know, when uh, there's some people who've talked to me about running for the Senate, I give them the same answer that I did when I had that chance in 1988. In the Senate, you can stop anything you want to, but you can't pass anything. In the House, you can pass things. And that's why I've stayed in the House. Thank you. Eric Hedman, the Berlin. Well, a um, couple of things have been bothering me. Uh, and it comes to what other people have talked about here. Earlier this year, first time in my life, I served on a jury. 
And my opinion of the legal system in this country couldn't have fallen faster. It was a disgusting case that should have never been prosecuted. And I looked at, there was a man who owned a restaurant, was trying to protect his kitchen from a drunk patron. And he gets arrested. The police have come in, both said the other one was in charge and neither one um, interviewed a witness. It was a horrible no case and yet it gets prosecuted. He has to go through and had a very impressive attorney. He had never been arrested before in his life. He's in his 70s. And when you listen to him, the prosecutor, you think the guy had the character of Al Capone. It took us less than a minute to find this guy not guilty. It took longer to find a foreman for the jury. <laughs> and when I look at, when you talked about school safety, I have a niece who's 16 years old. After the last shooting in Santa Fe, Texas, she was terrified. And I had her, told her, go talk to the principal. Ask him if they're going to ask for this money for security for the school. And she did, and they said yes. When we're doing these things, we need competent people to do it. Let's say like for the mental health checks. I've known a number of people in the mental health system. A lot of them, to me, do not come across as competent. So how do we do these things and still get back to doing it right? Because you can throw money at an issue and not solve it. <coughs> and one thing after another, let's say like immigration, I remember in 1978, Jimmy Carter, went to China and was lecturing Joe and Lai about not letting people who want to leave out. And Joe and Lai said, do you really want 60 million immigrants a year from our country for the next five years? And I think Joe and Lai said, I'll send them to you. Yeah, he did. We, hey, you look at, like for immigration, on the other side, the people who are in favor. Well, how many are we supposed to take? We've taken since 1963 more immigrants than any, the rest of the world combined. We can't do it all. We don't have the people to do it. How do we do what we do better? And it just bothers me, after, especially after seeing this trial. The district attorney's office, the judge actually really impressed me. He told me he had 500 cases on his docket, and more than half of them are opioid related. We're getting overwhelmed by these things. We can pass laws and say we're going to do things. But if we're not doing it right, or if we're not doing it correctly, what good does it do? That's well, fine. You, know, you know, what I can say is that Senator Portman and I, you know, passed uh, the leading uh, bill to uh, combat the opioid addiction crisis, which is severe. You know, we lose more people in this state, in this country, from opioid addiction than we do in car crashes. That's, that's gas money. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is comprehensive. You know, there's, there's, there's money for counseling. You know, there's money for treatment. There's money for early intervention. There's money for law enforcement. There's money for education. There's money to put the Narcan, uh, uh, you know, anti-opioid, uh, you know, drug in every ambulance so that when the EMTs come and pick somebody up who's dying as a result of an overdose, they can give them some Narcan, which will keep them going till they get to the ER. Mm -hmm. We have to work on funding, and that's going to be one of my top priorities in the next Congress. The other thing we need to do is we need to get uh, after fentanyl analogs. Uh, you know, there is no law against fentanyl analogs. There is a law that makes fentanyl a Schedule II narcotic. But the analogs, you know, which are, you know, where the nutty chemist, you know, ends up being able to have, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, different analog. There is no law against that, so people can trade that you know, scot-free, you know, there's a regulation, uh, an emergency regulation that the DEA has put on it, but that's drafted in a way that a very good defense lawyer will be able to get his client off the hook, but, uh, you know, pretty quickly. So, we, you know, this is what the federal government is doing. The state government has got a role, and Attorney General Schimmel has been spending quite a bit of time, and I'll defer to Janelle to talk to what the legislature is doing, but a lot of this has got to be done locally. You know, it's got to be done, first of all, with families. You know, my son or my daughter is getting hooked on uh, this stuff. Help. 
and there will be the resources to get the help to the person who is getting addicted or to try to bring, to bring them back if they're already addicted. Uh, we've got to use the schools and the churches on this, you know, basically to educate people uh, that this stuff isn't candy. We have to deal with physicians who over-prescribe uh, uh, opioids to their patients. And we have to deal with patients when the doctor says, no more for you, you're getting hooked. They go across the street to the other doctor who has no idea what the previous doctor has prescribed and he starts writing uh, prescriptions. You know, it's, it's spiraling you know, off the abyss that way. So, you know, this is you know, a complicated problem you know, that faces the entire country. Uh, and we, you know, the whole country, and that means all 310 million of us are going to have to get involved in this. You know, this is not something that say, well, you know, let's elect or rely on our elected officials to do it. Uh, we're doing what we can, but we need help, and we need help from everybody. Janelle? And the state of Wisconsin has taken very seriously uh, to the point where we have what's called the hope agenda, which is to reduce not only for doctors, which is about 12 different bills. We've taken part different pieces of this, from the doctors now having a state system, which you go to an emergency room, whatever doctor you go to, and you prescribe those tier of opiate drugs that each doctor has access to that easily. And they know, so you can't doctor shop in the state of Wisconsin anymore. It's become much more difficult. We've also gone through to the high schools and the schools and uh, the rest of the, even dentists, and now they're prescribing much less because you would, you know, you can only get 30 pills. It's now less than a week is what you're getting. So um, there are different rules that we've put in place. We've also tried to address the different chemistry that goes on and made them all illegal, uh, trying to help law enforcement going apart, uh, going forward. So. Yes, there are different pieces to it. We've had several bills moving that forward because honestly, we're losing that age group that we're talking about is really 15 to 30. I mean, we're losing a whole generation of young adults. Well, my niece knows several people who already died from this. And uh, you see a 16 year old, one of the things she's growing up in a protected environment, but around her, she's seeing people drop over dead from this. And my experience with that trial. <coughs> Is as people apply it. Voltaire made the comment, he said, common sense isn't very common. We have to try to, I guess you're right at all levels, everybody try to think a little smarter, do a little bit better, and hopefully we can improve on this. Thank you. Former Milwaukee County District Attorney E. Michael McCann of Wauwatosa. Right. Thank you, Madam Chief. First, I want to express appreciation for you appearing here on Sunday night. I'm keenly aware that at least half of the week you're separated from your family and you're taking this time. I hope you're not discouraged. It was reported that only one person appeared at GroupCon. I hope that does not discourage you from continuing these programs. Well, it's, it's, I think I really respect you for putting the deputies out to do this. It will. Good. I'm appearing as a member of the voice of the poor committee of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Uh, this is a group of lay persons, predominantly Catholic who assist the poor by providing food, clothes, furnishings, and occasionally rent or utility payment assistance. We visit people that are willing to assess need. We maintain two meal sites in Milwaukee County, which together provided over 100,000 meals last year and support a number of food pantries in Catholic parishes. Service is based on need without regard to race, nationality, gender, or creed. As you know, Vincentians and Milwaukee Archdiocese reside in Dodd, Milwaukee, Ozaukee, Washington, and Waukesha counties. The voice of the poor committee is charged with expressing the position of the society on social justice issues. We view the Bill Farm Bill addressing as it does the needs of so many poor as morally significant legislation. I'm aware that it was defeated on, on, April, on, on May 18th, but it was reported, at least in our newspaper, that there was a division and the issue wasn't as much on the contents of the bill as the desire of some in the majority to force Paul Ryan to bring on the uh, immigration bill before consideration of the Farm Bill, and that the Farm Bill will appear again on the agenda sometime this month for a vote up or down. For that reason, I'm appearing and stating our position on the Farm Bill. I know, down, I know that on Friday afternoon, the Senate issued its Farm Bill. Uh, I have not had an opportunity to study that, but I will over the coming week. I just want to say that we support and commend the provisions in the, in the current bill, H.R. 2, 
renewing and funding the Emergency Food Assistance Program, TFAP, and the Commodity Statement Supplemental Food Program, CSFP. We also support provisions in the bill containing continuing international food security and development, including Food for Peace, the Governor Dole, Food for Progress, and Farmer to Farmer programs. As of incentives, we have frequent contact with persons on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, that's SNAP, the old food stamps, and have direct knowledge of their situations. We are opposed to the revision of the bill ending state options for broad-based categorical eligibility. We believe that enactment of that provision will, will result in the removal of as many as two million persons from the program. And as I believe you know, the impact will be felt most by working citizens earning between 130 and 200 percent of the federal poverty level. We also oppose the proposal to increase penalties for failing to meet the staff, the SNAP work requirement. For the first offense, from one month cut off to a year cut off, and for the second offense, from a three-month cutoff to a three-year cutoff. We think those penalties are quite severe. This would mean for some people who need food to be deprived of that food. So again, raising it from one month penalty to one year, raising it from three months to three years, we think is severe and unreasonable. We were also concerned that the persons who need to get jobs under the program, persons 50 to 60, unemployed persons, will be provided not only a one-month opening, one-month period to get those jobs, rather than the current three months. We're concerned not only for city people where there may be difficulty, but in rural areas where there's difficulty to travel to programs or where there may be fewer jobs available in the rural areas. Um, I will be attaching, going to make a submission, a, a joint letter dated April 18, 2018 from the United States Catholic Bishops Conference, from the Catholic Relief Services, the Catholic Charities USA, Catholic Rural Life, and the St. Vincent de Paul Society, addressed to Congressman Michael Conway, Chairman of the House Agricultural Committee, setting forth positions on the farm bill, we are in accord with the provisions of that letter. Thank you again for conducting this town hall meeting in Nottingham Falls and for the consideration you hope you will give. Yes. Well, thank you. You know, uh, just very briefly, Mike, uh, uh, what I will say is I think there should be a work requirement for able-bodied people who receive SNAP or food stamp benefits. Uh, there's been an awful lot of fraud in the food stamp program. Uh, the dollar that is wasted due to fraud is a dollar that can't be given to a legitimately in need person. And uh, that has got to be addressed. We can give this to, to Joe over here. Uh, you know, I have sent people to prison for welfare fraud. So yes. I, I, yeah, I know you sent a lot of people to prison for welfare fraud. Good for you for doing that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we're not here to oppose the work requirement. Talking about the penalties yeah. and the fact that they have to get to work so quickly in the short term. Mm -hmm. so for in the rural area, particularly, I think to get to a job training program, we don't have a car, you live in a small town, yeah. 25 miles away. Would you look at those penalties? By, by, the, by the way, the, the, the farm bill did increase the value of a car that a SNAP recipient can own to $12,000. So we don't have to drive around, you know, in a beater where you have to trade that it doesn't die between here and there. You'll see that in the letter, we appreciate we approve that and agree. I do want to say in passing, he didn't come to testify though, but I'm well aware of the, fire, of the prison bill that we just passed mm -hmm. uh, and bipartisan support. I know it's before the Senate. I know there's some uh, resistance from Senator Grassley, uh, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's a bipartisan bill, the Sentencing Reform Act of 2017. And I hope you're able to work out with the Senate. Well, you know, I want to see sentencing reform. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I worked for a year and a half with uh, <coughs> Bobby Scott at the Denver, Virginia. Uh, on a uh, criminal justice reform task force, which was very enlightening. And, you know, there has to be a package of sentencing reform, you know, in prison uh, work training so that people have skills when they get out of prison, and a second chance program so that once they get out of prison, they don't hang out with the people who got them in trouble in the first place. Uh, the, President Reform Bill only deals with the second of these, although Mark Bellick gave me a lot, a lot of heat because there is a provision where people who are elderly and ill, you know, could be released from prison before their sentence was up, you know, into a supervised uh, 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 setting. And, you know, my point in response to that is somebody who's 80 years old and has a lot of trouble getting around isn't going to hit up the 7-Eleven and run away with their walker. 
So, Mark Belling was not a keen supporter of mine, so okay. <laughs> he throws a pie in my face every once in a while, too. Carol Harder, Western Avenue, Germantown. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, just a couple little comments. Um, the tax cut and jobs bill, I think, is a little misnomer because um, we don't need job openings as much as we need decent wages for people um, in terms of the uh, goal to get the uh, basic rate of pay increase. Um, and it gave people one-time bonuses, but not increase their wages. I don't see how that helps the average person. And I've been reading about companies that have used that tax money that they got to buy stocks, so it increases their value on the stock exchange. And they still can send jobs overseas without paying a, a big penalty. And Harley Davidson is just to release some more workers. So I don't, I don't agree with the benefits of that. Well, you know, what I, what I can say is I think that this was a significant contributing factor to the fact that the economy is booming, unemployment is low, minority unemployment amongst African Americans and Hispanics is a 17-year low. And, you know, where, you know, as we've heard with the previous speaker, uh, we have more job openings than unemployed in this country, and that's it's been a long time, if ever, you know, that that has happened. Now, you know, the Congress and the government have nothing to do with wages. We have a free market economy, and it's up to the employers to make a determination on what the wages or the salaries of their uh, employees are. Uh, and when you have the government saying how much or how little uh, you can pay, that was kind of like uh, uh, what freed uh, uh, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and the becoming economic basket cases. It didn't work there and it won't work here. So, you know, I guess what I can say is I disagree with you. You know, the thing is, is that there isn't a penalty to send jobs or money overseas. The issue is, is the penalty for bringing it back. They, you know, that's where the huge repatriation tax was, uh, which was lower. And we never would get that $38 billion from Apple if we kept the old tax code because they would have kept that money overseas, not brought it back, you know, not created new factories. And they said that when all these factories are built, there will be 20,000 new American jobs that are fairly high paid. I think that's a win-win situation. Jane Kyle, Amy Bell Road, Colgate. Thank you, uh, and thank you for bringing this, um, this session because I really it. I had a couple of things and following up with um, the people that are having difficulty, financial difficulty, they have to work 30 hours a week beyond SNAP uh, in Wisconsin and 20 hours maximum for health, uh, Medicaid health insurance through Wisconsin. I don't understand that. How can you get, you can't be on SNAP if you're getting health insurance, Medicaid through the state. And um, you know, I understand where we want to work. You know, I'll defer to Representative Branch on this one, state issue. So the state of Wisconsin has made the determination that if you are a, a, an able-bodied individual, that you should be looking for work for 30 hours during the week. I think your second question was? If you work over 20 hours a week, the state looks at your, um, you know, what you make and how many hours you've worked and they will cut off your insurance, your Medicaid insurance. I, you know, I'm not aware of any insurance being cut off for certain yes. hours, but you'd have to give me a more <coughs> specific case to, for me to be able to answer that. I can do that. But sure, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And then my other question was, um, I had a similar question to Joanne had here, was uh, when we're looking at taking these children away from these people that have come up from El Salvador, um, and we're putting them in an old uh, post on Walmart on the border, whatever we're doing, um, it makes no sense to me uh, of how, why we're taking them away from these parents and they're not going to be able to get uh, hearings 
in a timely fashion like you were talking about. I think we understand that, but we don't understand why these children, uh, Jeff Sessions has agreed that these children should be pulled away from their parents. You know, the, the change from first in, first out, to last in, first out is fairly new. It's been less than a month, you know. So people who come across, you know, now and who claim asylum, they'll be first in line to tell their story to the judge and the judge will decide. And, you know, as far as allegations that children are being taken away from their parents, I think I already answered that question. Well, the, the, the kids, I mean, there's been documentation that these kids are separated from their parents and they're in a facility without their parents. And I, maybe that's not true. And I would a ask you to look into that. Okay. Marianne Hoople, Homestead Drive in the Falls. Ms. Ms. Hoople still here, going once, going twice. David Yankee, Tall Oaks Drive, Brookfield. This is not that. I'm a, I was a small businessman who was also a medical practitioner. I lived with thousands of pages of laws every single day of my life. I tried to honor them. Sometimes I get the impression we have one set of laws for us little people, and in Washington, we seem to tolerate corruption in both parties. And nothing seems to ever happen. We, the Republicans, scream, lock her up. And I'm not opposed to that because when Hillary flew to, to help buy a UBS bank, who saved them hundreds of billions of dollars, the UBS bank gave Bill a good million and a half dollars to come have a chat. If that wasn't legal, it should have been legal. Now, if we're going to lose our ability to complain about what the Democrats did because, gosh, I thought we had an emoluments clause. Our president is negotiating with China as China gives his daughter extraordinarily valuable trademarks. Our president has an interest and is going to make millions of dollars with his name on a development in Indonesia, which is, oh, being built with a $500 million loan from China. Our president has a hotel right down the street, which charges exorbitant prices, and foreign companies go there, the countries, because they want to think they'll please the president, and we do nothing. Why is why are Republicans? How can we complain about the Democrats not you know taking putting holding their people account when we not want to be called? Well, you know, you know what, what what I can say is this. You know, first of all, Trump has said that he will give the any profits of foreign governments staying at any of his hotels back to the treasury. Yeah, right. Well, he's not keeping the books. Well. All I can say is that, you know, he has directed that uh, to take place. And, you know, I know he's not keeping the books, but he never kept the books for, you know, any of the hotels. You know, you know he has directed that, and uh, his children, who are actually running the Trump enterprises, you know, have the responsibility to make sure that that happens. Now, you know... You know, we Republicans have been complaining about, you know, unequal, you know, application of, of the law, you know, where you had Jim Comey say that Hillary was not going to be prosecuted before he even interviewed uh, Mrs. Clinton, you know, where we've had a special counsel investigation, you know, that has been going on kind of in secret, you know, for over a year, and what the special counsel was appointed to do, there haven't been any indictments about, you know, alleged collusion. You know, what I can say is speaking for the House of Representatives, you know, there is a bipartisan uh, enforcement of common sense and common decency. Republican and Democratic members who have been involved in sexual harassment have been forced to resign by their respective leadership, without exception. Uh, and, you know, I could name them if you want, me too, but I think we all uh, know who they are. And, you know, this is even before there's an ethics committee investigation. Whoever their party leadership has called them up, you know, and it said, time's up, buddy. And uh, usually there is a resignation that is submitted uh, uh, before our close of business that day. That's the way it ought to work. But, you know, when you're dealing with people who've got civil service protection or people who are appointed by fixed terms, you know, it so it takes a little bit longer to get rid of them uh, when, you know, they have uh, uh, broken the law. 
You know, I have voted for practically every whistleblower's protection bill that has come up and has sponsored, you know, a few of them that have actually uh, passed and become law. You know, the way you have confidence in the government is weeding out the bad apples before they spoil the whole barrel. And, you know, I'm committed to that. And I guess the thing that I will, you know, finally sound off on is that any member of Congress who is convicted of a felony by a jury, the next day I have an expulsion resolution ready to go because felons belong in jail, they don't belong in Congress. And the last one that was convicted of a felony because he stonewalled it was a man named Chaka Fatah from Philadelphia. He was convicted, I had the resolution ready to go, you know, I said that uh, it was a day that we were about ready to adjourn for a summer recess. I said if we have to stay here until 6 in the morning, we're going to debate this and we're going to vote on this. Well, lo and behold, uh, the senior Democrat from Philadelphia uh, came up with a letter of resignation and handed it to me uh, within about three hours. The guy was gone off the payroll, no benefits, except those that he would get as a prisoner of the federal government. But the fundamental question is, the president and his family is receiving direct benefits from foreign governments and nothing's happening. Well, you know, Jared Kushner, Jared Kushner is running all this world, using his government position to line up hundreds of millions of dollars of cash for his family business and nothing happens. Sir, sir, that's a criminal offense what you have just said. The president, you know, has business interests since the beginning days of the republic. No president has been forced to divest himself of his business interests. Now he's got more of them and more complicated ones of them. But remember back when George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were not required to free their slaves to become president of the United States. So they still had their business interests even though they were you know, using, you know, involuntary laborers uh, to be able to, uh, to do that. Now, you know, if he has committed a crime, uh, the Public Integrity Division of the Department of Justice is very active in investigating those kinds of things. But, you know, to say that because the president's daughter, who is an emancipated, not minor, ends up getting trademarks, is the reason that the president should not go to China and talk to the president of China and other Chinese government officials or host them when they come here uh, goes back to isolationism. And, you know, we are a world power and we ought to talk to people. You know, not that we would agree with them. You know, good Lord, in a couple of days, uh, the president is going to be talking to the leader of a country that has agreed with us on nothing for the last 70 years. Peggy Reeder, Fond du Lac Avenue, Germantown. Thank you for having these meetings. I appreciate that. Um, I had several questions, but I guess I'll go with um, the president has been aligning himself more and more with Russia. One, in that he's not enforcing all the sanctions that Congress passed. Number two, um, he's not getting tough with Putin about tampering with our election. He's not um, prioritizing attention to see that the cyber attacks are. Uh, defended and now he's asking for Russia to be uh, included in the GC summit. Doesn't any of this concern you? Well, you know, I'm no friend of Russia and I think Vladimir Putin's a thug. You know, he wants to reinstate the Soviet Union in the bad old days. He's the next Crimea, which was a part of Ukraine. He has taken the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, the three Baltic republics that border on Russia you know, are extremely nervous that they are next. Let me say this, however. You know, I have always taken the position that having better relations with Russia is in the interest of the United States. And remember, it was Nixon and Reagan that negotiated arms control treaties with Russia that helped bring about the end of the Cold War, the public presence, you know. Uh, you know, I might, I might add on that. So, you know, putting Russia in the deep freeze uh, uh, when there is a way uh, to get, you know, better relations with him, I think is a mistake because if we put them in the deep freeze, things will keep on spiring downward and downward and downward. And Putin has been spending 
an awful lot of time building up this military from when it fell apart, you know, in the last days of the Soviet Union and the first days after uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. So he wants to be, you know, a first-rate military power. I think one of the things that we have to do is be very careful that he does not have an economic chokehold over our allies in Western Europe, particularly through the sale of natural gas uh, there, which is one of the reasons why the Germans get very, very skittish when we talk about getting uh, tough with Putin and the Russians. But, you know, it wasn't too long ago when the Republicans were the hardliners and the Democrats said we ought to get along uh, better with Russia. I, I think that you know, what we ought to do is look at it on an issue-by-issue -issue basis and in the context of where America is at any point in time, rather than having inflexible uh, positions, whereas if the Democrats or the Republicans say the Russians are bad, 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 and if the Republicans and Donald Trump is in, the Democrats say the same thing. And then when the outs come in and the ins go out, then everything gets flipped. Now uh, that would be confusing in the Kremlin, I think. We ought to have a consistent foreign policy. Might I add, might, might I ask, are you okay that they interfere with our elections? Should we not? No, they, 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 should, they should not do that. But I would point out that Green Party candidate Jill Stein petitioned for a complete ballot-by-ballot ballot recount in Wisconsin after the last presidential election and paid for it. So there was no taxpayer's money in there. There was no sign whatsoever that anybody tampered, you know, with, with anything to do yes, with... It doesn't matter. I'm with, talking about... Well, what do you mean it doesn't matter? You know, there were, there were about four and a half million ballots that were cast, and none of them looked fishy. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the clerks all around the state, you know, have to go through them all and, and see what happened. Now, you know, Russian interfering with democratic elections is nothing new. It has gone back to Soviet times. You know, I remember, you know, that the Russians moved heaven and earth to try to prevent Reagan from winning both time. They've been into the German election. They've been into Brexit. You know, they, uh, they supported uh, through loans from uh, state-controlled banks, the far-right-wing anti-immigrant National Front Party in the last French presidential election. You know, you know, we are doing, you know, what we can to prevent this, but you have to remember that under Article One, Section Four of the Constitution, the states run the elections. The federal government doesn't, and the Constitution is pretty plain on that. Archie Reader, same address. Um, and this will be the last one before we go to personal problems time. When I got here, I, I, I thought about what it was that I'd like to speak about. Um, and a lot of the topics have, been, topics have been touched on. One that hasn't is ZTE. And the gentleman that mentioned the emoluments clause, it's odd that Ivanka got the uh, trademarks four or five days before the president stands up and says, geez, we've got to save those Chinese jobs and, and get, re reduce the sanctions against uh, China. We don't uh, have any sanctions against China. <laughs> we, we have tariffs we, against China. Oh, we, we just sanctioned this sanction. Did we not take action against ZTE because they were giving information to North Korea and Iran? What action was taken to That was a not? violation of sanctions against North Korea and Iran. And we took action against ZTE accordingly. Yes, and that is an executive branch decision. Now, they had a chance uh, to plead their case. Congress has nothing to do uh, with that issue. That is you know, entirely an executive branch issue. If they pled their case and uh, were able to convince uh, uh, the Secretary of Commerce and the Trade Representative, uh, that they weren't guilty, then the sanctions should have gone off. And either way, a week either way, Ivanka gets trademarks, the president gets a half a well, million Well, now, 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 sir, you know, with all due respect, if Ivanka was determined to deserve a trademark, should she be denied a trademark because her father has, happens to be the president of the United States? Perhaps That's not be. equal justice under law. You know, if you, if you fulfill the requirements for a trademark in this country or any other country, you get the trademark. You know, that's a protection of intellectual property rights is what your trademark is. 
And to say because for a political reason, which is extraneous completely, you know, from the intellectual property protection law, that somebody shouldn't get a trademark, you know, honestly, sir, you know, I think is saying that because she happens to be the daughter of the president, she is not entitled to something that she's legally entitled to under Chinese law. She's an That's officer. wrong. She's an officer of the executive branch. She is an advisor to the executive so, branch. So what? So, so what? So what? You know, there are there, there people who work for the University of Wisconsin system that get trademarks and copyrights for their invention. Clearly, I'm not going to change your mind. Other issues. No, no, no. I, you know, again, I'm standing up for the rule of law. And, and I'm not for bending it and twisting it because we don't like a politician. Okay. And that's what you're trying to do, and, sir. And, and, and you've taken that position consistently when, I, when I've come to meetings. When, when we look at the government today, January 17th last year, um, we, you, you said that there, there's been no collusion or, or uh, uh, there's been no collusion or which would the other the other charge obstruction. There's been no collusion or obstruction charge from the Mueller committee. No, but you've had four people that have agreed and turned state's witness. They're they're speaking with Mueller because they have violated the law, and consistently we hear. And, and what have they violated the law on? It was things that Mr. Manafort did even before Trump announced he was a candidate for President of the United States. And General Flynn? General Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI on a question they didn't ask. And the reason he pleaded guilty is because he would have been bankrupted to defend himself. You know, that's not being fair either where you have the largest law firm in the world, the United States Department of Justice, going after a person who is living on a retired lieutenant general's pension. He's lost his house. He's almost bankrupt now. And it was for pleading guilty to lying to the FBI on a question they never asked him. Now, come on now, you gotta be fair. And that's How not being fair. fair. To the general doesn't have the money to support it, so he has to, he, he has to plead guilty when you have a complete uh, judicial system where people can't afford what they're doing either. They can't afford to buy the best lawyers. You get the best justice you can buy. Another point, Scott Pruitt. Where are you at with Scott Pruitt? Uh, Scott Pruitt can be fired by the president anytime the president wants to fire him. What's your opinion of Scott Pruitt? I think he has uh, had some severe lapses of judgment in his personal life. Uh, the, the last question I have, uh, the involvement of the Russian Russians on the June 16th meeting with Kushner, Manafort, uh, Donald Jr., and multiple Russians uh, looking at dirt on Hillary. When the UAE and Saudi came and again offered foreign money, None of these meetings were identified in the initial revelations when they went into office. Manafort filed as uh, a retroactive agent. Uh, uh, Jerry Kushner denied that there were meetings. Oh, yeah, geez, and this list of 103 people, yeah, I, I did meet with them over time. How did, how, how did they get away with that? The gentleman over here that talked about two different sets of rules that's certainly All I can say is the investigation is ongoing. Which you Congress, do not favor. It's been going on for a year, is what you said. Yeah, it's been going on for a year. They haven't come up with an indictment on anything that they were appointed to look at and spent $17 million. How That's much why it was Watergate. Took four what? Years. Watergate took four years. Benghazi took two years. There were no indictments from either of those. All I can say is Not that, you know, uh, you know, with Watergate, there were criminal activities and there were indictments. There were a lot of pleas. Uh, pleas. As I seem to recall from Watergate, the plumbers spent a lot of time behind bars. Fair Those enough. were indictments from Watergate, uh, directly involved in Watergate. There has not been an indictment from Mueller and his team on Russian collusion in the election to date against anybody. Yeah. I, I understand your position that the president was elected to be our president. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem as if there's an issue that's been raised this evening that you'll stand up and say, you know, he really missed on that one. Uh, how about tariffs, sir? Or 
Or weren't you, you listening? Yes. Yes, I was. Okay, thank you. One. Okay. <laughs> this concludes uh, the time we have for the general issues. Uh, I would like to talk about, uh, talk to those of you, and I know